means business. Always in the forefront in adopting, nurturing, excelling in a newer interventional procedures, but also equally at academic level. Some people will be hard working on the cat lab, but he had not forgotten to be in the academic field. That was shown by his publication. 300 publications in 17 years, unimaginable, I will say. And uh, not only the publication, the, the quality of publication is, ex is exposed by the uh, citations. 81,497, my God, I am not happy. Uh, in a 17 years, 81,497 citations. And look at the action depths, it is 98. And look at the I-10 index, it is 410. This contribution, his contribution alone goes to around, Tower is around 1,000 in number, apart from many thousands of metal clay, PDA closure, ASD closure, peripheral and carotid interventions, all the vessels in the body. So with this uh, short introduction, I'm very fortunate to be listened to such a uh, icon of uh, interventional procedure there. At this juncture, uh, may I request our Murli and Bhupati to pitch in to invite Professor Samir Kapadia to deliver his long awaited lecture by sense uh, everybody in the loop is quite eager to listen to you. You over to Dr. Murli or uh, Bhupati, please. Murli, sir, please, sir. Yeah, that's Dr. Murli. Murli, sir, you are not, uh, you are muted, I think, sir. Murli, so, no, I am I audible now? Yes, yeah, sir. Audible, yes. audible, audible. Sorry, my, my network, the problem in the network, I have to re-log in. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here in the evening uh, in a program uh, chaired by two, two diens. One, my chief, Brother Daniya Chalam, sir, who was an iconic image for a generation in India, including me. And the very same program, the talk is going to be an icon at a global level. It's going to be a great moment me sitting as a moderator between two giants. So without wasting much of the time, it's my great pleasure and I feel honored and the privilege to me to welcome Dr. Kapadia, Samir Kapadia to deliver his talk in the grand rounds. And thank you for Bhupati and my colleagues for making this program a vivid and lively one. Thank you, ST sir. Uh, I think that we can invite Samir Kapadia to join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very, very kind introduction. First and foremost, you know, I am uh, still, uh, you know, compared to all the giants that uh, have invited me and all the people there, I'm still a young, uh, a young person. And uh, I'm very thankful for uh, this kind invitation and uh, incredibly uh, generous introduction. Uh, I, want to, I want to stress that my talk, what I was asked to deliver was to say that uh, how uh, I, uh, we I went from uh, uh, a uh, and here I'll show you that. Uh, so the talk that I'm going to give today is not going to talk too much about the research and new innovations. I will, uh, but to talk about how uh, the journey from NHL uh, to Cleveland Clinic happened and what was the uh, what was the way that this journey could be accomplished uh, in a in, uh, in this uh, time. So I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction of myself. So I'm first of all, very similar to a lot of people that are listening to this talk, uh, you know, very, uh, very uh, excited, uh, very, uh, you know, very excited to be part of cardiology, very uh, devoted uh, to the field. And uh, as most of you are very capable of doing uh, the different types of work that is needed uh, to help the patients. Uh, so uh, just to highlight, uh, I was born in Ahmedabad uh, and uh, 
I went to a school which is a Gandhian school uh, in Ahmedabad, which is uh, in Gujarati uh, language. Uh, and this is a school that is uh, founded by Gandhian principles. So we used to wear khadi and we used to work uh, in a very, uh, very simplistic kind of an environment. Uh, I did uh, get the NCERT scholarship, which is uh, one of the uh, scholarships that you get as a uh, national scholarship. Uh, I went, to be honest with you, I did not want to be a doctor. So I applied for the Indian Institute of Technology uh, IIT uh, exams, and uh, I went to Hawaii. Uh, I was uh, admitted there uh, in Mumbai. I did the first semester there. And then I changed my mind that I want to go back. My dad is a cardiologist. So I said that I'll go back to uh, medical school. And then I went to NHL Municipal Medical College. From there, I went to Baylor College of uh, Medicine in Houston. Uh, this is uh, a transition that happened because uh, my dad who's a cardiologist suggested that, you know, if you want to do cardiology, uh, you know, if you can work with DeBakey and Cooley, uh, these were the stalwart cardiac surgeons at that time. Uh, it would be an exciting uh, time for you. So that's why I applied to Baylor College of Medicine. I was lucky enough to get there where I got, uh, they gave me the uh, certificate for being an outstanding resident there. And then I went to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and in Cleveland Clinic, uh, I did my fellowship. Uh, again, I did my international fellowship there. And then I went to University of Washington for a few years to, while my wife was doing her ophthalmology training, uh, I served as a staff there and then came back to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so uh, I also went uh, to Harvard Business School for uh, uh, a year or so uh, to learn about uh, administration, uh, a little bit of the business side and uh, uh, finished the course while I was working at uh, Cleveland Clinic. This, the important part that I want to mention is that this is not possible without the greatest mentors. And this is also my responsibility nowadays to make sure that I train young people uh, to do what they want to do, give them all the opportunities, give them all the credits and work with them. So to start with, this is Dr. Uh, this is uh, my professor, uh, Dr. A.R. Rao, uh, who trained me in mathematics. This is how I went to uh, Cleveland, uh, I went to uh, IIT. Uh, this is Dr. Doug Mann, uh, who is now the chairman of cardiology at uh, Washington University. This is myself, uh, very young, uh, we are doing research there. This is in the cath lab with Dr. Tuju, Dr. Swenson. This is uh, when we are doing our first tower. This is Dr. Pat Whitlow and myself where uh, he also uh, trained me and helped me. This is with Dr. Eric Topol. Uh, this is Jim Young. Uh, this is Ed Lynch, who is my program director. And this is uh, Dr. Tuju, uh, myself and my wife. Uh, these are my two kids. Uh, and uh, they are both uh, right now. Uh, this is a relatively recent picture. And my parents, my dad and my, wife, my mom, dad is a cardiologist and mom is a pediatrician. So what I want to highlight is that how all these things are possible and how these things happen, uh, that going from uh, a, uh, a moderately recognizable school in, uh, in India uh, to one of the premier institutes of uh, cardiology in the country. Right now, for the last 27 years, Cleveland Clinic has been voted as number one center in the U.S., and uh, we are very proud of that. So... Initially, when I went to, and these are some of the details that might be interesting to people. So these are the, so in 1995, I want to say, uh, so this is clearly 25 years ago. The first, of, first part was to do research because I was very interested in doing some academic work. Uh, and I wanted to learn some basic science. So on top of doing the clinical work, uh, I started doing basic research. And uh, so this is, you know, all kinds of basic research, but the idea was to find the TNF alpha receptors in the heart. So we took the, the hearts from the cardiac transplant, the explanted hearts, and then stained them for the TNF alpha receptors. And as you can see here, we found TNF alpha receptors 
protein. This is the uh, Western blot. And we found that the PNF alpha protein was available, was there uh, in uh, the two receptors, R1 and R255 and 75 kilodaltons, are both present in the cardiac myocytes. Then the second thing I did was to say that we took the TNF alpha, what produces TNF alpha in the heart, whether the TNF alpha can be produced in the heart or not. And I showed that the TNF alpha is produced in the heart with acute pressure overload. So we took the Langendorf preparation, put the hearts, uh, increase the pressure, and then try to see if the TNF alpha can be increased in the heart. Then one step further, and all these papers were published in very good journals uh, to say that the TNF alpha was not only present in the heart, but also produced by the cardiac myocytes. So this is an insight to hybridization of messenger RNA. This is a technique that time was new now, very frequently done uh, to say that this uh, messenger RNA was present inside of the cardiac myocyte. So this was the two years of my, during my residency that I did this basic science research. Then I went to Cleveland Clinic. Uh, so I wanted to know that if this is really true for the patients. So I took the patient's serum and measured the TNF alpha and the aortic valve gradient. And there was an association between how much cytokines were released in the patients with uh, heart failure. So this was an interesting uh, clinical correlation uh, to that. And then after that, uh, because of the very heavy uh, clinical work, my focus has been on the outcome research. So the outcome research is to say that what are the different ways we treat coronary artery disease, for example. Uh, so coronary artery disease and aortic stenosis, left main, multivessel disease, stable coronary disease. So these were the, I put some papers because I, I cannot go through all the papers, but to say that the severe aortic stenosis and coronary artery disease, how do we manage it? What is the best way to manage? Can we do PCI in patients with severe AS? And so we looked at our patients. So this is the uh, patients with severe AS in Cleveland Clinic, 250 patients with severe AS that we did PCI and their outcomes were excellent. They did not die. So it was a safe safe way to treat this disease. However, nowadays, what we, I tell people is that the best way to manage the coronary artery disease with aortic stenosis is as if they had aortic stenosis alone or coronary artery disease alone. Meaning that if you're not going to revascularize somebody for coronary artery disease, there's no point doing it just because they are going to have uh, aortic wall replacement in the, in the tower, uh, with tower. So this is an important part. Then the second one was to say that is there a role of uh, uh, ACE inhibitors in patients undergoing valve replacement, aortic valve replacement. So this is with normal EF, the ACE inhibitors decrease mortality in our clinical clinic data set. Now we are doing a randomized trial. This is to say that whether we do the courage-like protocol of the patients and see if there was a difference in mortality of these patients. And this study showed that yes, there was a mortality difference, even though courage did not show the mortality difference. Again, because how we select the patient, how we treat the patients in a randomized trial is quite different than in the real life. Uh, and this was very clearly seen in this particular study. Then the focus has been in the last few years has been on the TAVR, uh, SAVR, procedural modification and stroke related uh, studies with TAVR. So this is, this is the paper that I'm fairly proud of. So this is a five-year paper that we did. Of course, a lot of investigators. It is a partner B, trial, partner B study. And the idea is that we randomize patients uh, with aortic stenosis to undergo medical therapy versus TAVR. Now, remember the medical therapy, there is no medical therapy for aortic stenosis, but medical therapy or TAVR. And most of these patients with medical therapy had a balloon valvuloplasty. There are 179 patients in each group. And it's very sad that except for one patient, all the patients at five years now were not alive with medical therapy, whereas with valve replacement, they were alive. So this is when Braunwald published that curve to say that you know when the patients have symptoms of aortic stenosis, their mortality is very high. This was only with 14 patients. And this was not really a randomized trial. This was not a prospective study. This is a randomized prospective trial. So this is a very important thing. And of course, old now, so it's at least five, seven years old. Subsequently, 
we have done all these major trials of uh, low risk patients, intermediate risk patients with aortic valve and has been published in uh, good journals. Procedural modification. So procedural modification, these are the two recent papers. So the one thing we have been doing is that after we do the tower, we pull the pacemaker out of the right ventricle and put it in the right atrium and paste the right atrium right at there and then to see if we can conduct through the AV node the, uh, the impulses. If we can conduct at 120 beats per minute, then we do not need to worry about uh, worry about the patient keeping him in the hospital. And in that point, we discharge the patient the same day. So this is a very important uh, new method of uh, procedural modification. Also, instead of going in both groins, we started going in the same groin, and this is a easy way uh, to do the tower. So instead of bilateral access, we go in the same femoral artery with two accesses, one above, one below, and do the procedure. And this helps us for the bailout and helps us with the overall flow of the procedure. And patient also likes it because there are no two groins that are instrumented. We did several studies uh, about the stroke. Uh, and the uh, first one was to say, when does the stroke happen? Because there's some controversy that, you know, whether it happens immediately at the time of procedure or afterwards. And we proved that it is at the time of procedure. And then we did this very important study that you probably know, uh, where we took the uh, surgical patients versus transcatheter patients and said that, you know, the stroke is no different uh, between the transcatheter and surgical patients, if at all anything, the stroke is actually less with transcatheter for the major strokes. Uh, we also did a very important study uh, to have a sentinel device, that is the stroke prevention device uh, in the carotid artery and the nominate artery of the patients. Uh, and this particular study was positive in the sense that uh, we did find uh, that the procedural strokes were reduced, however, the MRI endpoint was negative. So now we are doing a protected tower trial, which is a multi-center trial with 3000 patients with the emboli protection device with and without uh, emboli protection device. I also focused on the Mitra clip. Again, this is the COEP trial uh, that we published uh, in uh, New England Journal a few years ago. And here, again, we randomized patients with Mitra clip for heart failure. This is a first trial to show that treating mitral regurgitation in patients with heart failure, you can change their outcome. So this is again, a very important part uh, to keep in mind that treating patients, uh, not with the LV dysfunction, heart failure, that now we are treating just mitral regurgitation and patients actually do better. Tricuspid valve replacement also has been my uh, area of interest. Uh, with Dr. Navia, we had developed this valve. Uh, this is a valve. This is myself, this is Dr. Navia, this is Amor, one of my uh, younger colleagues. Uh, and what we have done is we are replacing the valve, the tricuspid valve for the first time ever in a human. We did it in uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and this was a, called a Navigate valve. So this is a first in human implantation of the Navigate valve uh, where uh, we replaced the tricuspid valve. Remember the tricuspid annulus is very large. So we need, we had a 52 millimeter valve uh, to put in the tricuspid uh, orifice. Uh, several uh, important clinical trials that are one of them I mentioned, uh, the Sentinel emboli protection trial, then Watchman trial, carry on trial, protected tower trial. All of these are randomized trials, multi-center trials that right now uh, I'm uh, a PI for, and we, I'm using uh, this to, uh, help also uh, the patient enrollment. Innovation is an, another very important thing. So all these things are not possible unless you are going to be focused on doing something new. So uh, in terms of innovation, uh, I tried, uh, and I'll show you a few things uh, in a few minutes. So if you look at the growth of an institution, so if you want to have a over time a more growth, there are two ways to improve the growth. One is to change the performance. So if you have inefficiency in the systems where you know, patients cannot come, you know, changing the one from one cath lab to the other cath lab, it takes more time, things like that. Those things you can change and you can improve the performance gap. 
However, that does not take you to the next level. You need to improve something. You need to have new things happening to you. So you need to have new technologies. You need to have new areas. So it is not just enough to improve the efficiencies of the system, but also to engage in the innovation and in the new areas of uh, research. So how do we do that? So I, you know, there is a lot of different things that we did in cath lab and I published all these papers to say that we try to understand that what is the demand of the cath lab, uh, how many doctors have to be there in the cath lab, how fast we can turn around the patients, how we start on time and we don't delay everybody. We recruit the right young people because this is also very important to have a good team. So all these people were recruited and all of the new areas. Uh, so in the coronaries, for example, the CTO, supported PCI, structural, uh, all these new things with the aortic mitral tricuspid valve, peripheral also, CLI filters, all those things are very important uh, to keep in mind. And this is an important concept is that when we want to have a new strategy, it has to have innovation, alignment of focus and buy-in from people. You have to have leadership. You have to have people who are interested, not in themselves, but interested in the cause, interested in the purpose that they are going to take you to the next level. And then there are two parts. I call it a hardware and a software. So the hardware is that in organization, you need to have a structure, you need to have a system processes so that you have proper workflows, proper, proper work processes. Uh, and if, if let's say uh, you need to have a cath lab, echo lab, all these things working together, interdependencies, has to, be, has to be addressed. However, more important is the software part. Software part is hiring the right people with good characteristics, compatibility, capabilities, culture, that people understand that doing the best thing, innovation, quality, working together is very important. So if you have the proper software and hardware, then only you can go to the next level. And this was a very important part of uh, learning. So we call this a congruence model. And I wrote a paper with uh, the chairman of uh, Harvard Business School for this particular purpose in Jack to say that this is a very important part to understand that how we make a difference in the institution uh, to make things better. And these are the several papers that we wrote. This is the Six Sigma. This is the operational uh, abilities, operational efficiencies. And this is uh, with uh, Tushman. So Tushman is the uh, chairman of uh, Harvard Business School. Then a lot of other innovations we did in the cath lab to say that we have to have a proper software to track the patients. So all these different colors say that what level of procedures we are at. So we have 10 cath labs and uh, we, we have actually seven to eight cath labs working for the cardiology purposes, uh, international purposes, five to seven for EP purposes. And then we have four hybrid rooms. So when you look at all these cath labs, how do we make the cath labs function fast? So this is, these patients are done. This is ongoing. This is just finished. This is ongoing. These patients are ready. So all this software I developed, for example, with the help of a company and one of my students, then we track everything. So we say that, okay, if you have non-ST elevation MI, how long it takes from the patient coming to the hospital to put an order, what kind of investigation, how many time, how much time it takes to do the procedure and how you put an order, how we track it, how are their outcomes. So very important to have proper data so that we can, we can implement uh, different things. Education is key. So we cannot do all these things without a proper education. I, have, I was a program director for 10 years for the international cardiology. So many, many times I, I raised this issue that the fellows have to be trained properly, have to, given, have to be given independence, but at the same time, they should be rewarded for all the new things. So all the papers we write, I make them the first author, make sure that they, they can publish, uh, they can present, uh, they can be part of the, of part of the innovation. Uh, the... We wrote several textbooks. So these are all the textbooks. There's a textbook of international cardiology with all the, all my colleagues and fellows. This is the board review book. These are very large textbooks. 
uh, and uh, and we we write a just general cardiology book also uh, from Cleveland Clinic. Very important part of the process is to mentor the residents and the fellows. Uh, so you have to get them in the right uh, groove to do the research, do the innovation, not just do the procedures, because procedures is one part of the puzzle. Being a good doctor is very important. So I tell everybody that without seeing a patient should not do a procedure. You, you are not a proceduralist, but a good cardiologist. So in order to be a good proceduralist, you need to have proper understanding of when you want to do the procedure, when you do not want to do the procedure, how aggressive you want to be. Because unless you know the clinical situation, it is going to be extremely difficult to provide uh, an excellent care. And this is a very important part for the cardiology fellows to learn. Uh, as I said, procedure to life lessons. And then the junior staff also is very important to me that I want them to help with the case selection, procedural help. I scrub with them all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it's their case, not to get any credit from, from me, it is just to help them. And, uh, you know, and, and not, not a few, few patients that I scrub with. I scrub in hundreds of patients every year uh, with my, uh, my staff. And then I take a, uh, take a lot of pride in the fact uh, that there are, there are fellows that go to big institutions outside of Cleveland Clinic and lead the program. And these are some of the examples uh, that I put there. I'm also very interested in innovation. So uh, I have several patterns, several 15 or so, but it's very important to have this idea that if you are going to do something new, uh, you may want to pursue it. You want to uh, take it to the next level. So these are the devices that we develop. This is a transeptal needle, for example. Uh, the other one is a, there are a lot of different things. So this is the transeptal needle that just uh, stabilizes the needle inside of the RA so you can puncture easily. Uh, this is a, a device that helps to, uh, uh, helps to treat the mitral and the tricuspid valve regurgitation. Uh, and as I said, the research fostering has to be with a lot of different ways. So one is of course to have good people. We are right now working with the machine learning and genetics in our department. Uh, it has to, how do, you, how do you get funding? So the funding has to come from collaboration with the industry, sometimes with philanthropy, uh, and recruiting the right talent is very important in my mind. And in the United States, this is easy to get philanthropic support. And this is also now becoming very clear in India where you can have philanthropic support. Anything you do, you have to remain a good doctor. So clinical excellence is, uh, has to be there. And the clinical excellence, uh, so I have been involved in the first tower, first mitra click, first tricuspid, support devices, complex intervention, all of them in Cleveland Clinic. When you want to do something new, something that people have not done before or people have done before very few times, you have to be extremely careful, number one. You have to be very humble that these things are, are going to be difficult they have to be done in a very meticulous way and you have to have the best team. So again, to share everything with all the people uh, is very important that you do not say that this is just you who is going to do the procedure and who you are in charge and things like that. You have to work together. And as you can see, this, uh, this is the first tower team, you know, wonderful people. Dr. Tuju is my mentor, John Webb, Pat Whitlow, Lars Svensson. This is the first TMVR that we did in Cleveland Clinic. And this is uh, the Dr. Swenson, Stephanie, myself, Tuju. Uh, and this is the first uh, TTVR. This is the first tricuspid wall replacement I showed you with Jose, Navia, and uh, myself. So it is, it is very important to be a good doctor, good team player uh, to, to be able to do all these things. I am going to stop at this time. Uh, to take the questions. Uh, of course, there are several new technologies and new things that we keep doing, uh, but I thought that I'll stop here and um, I will answer the questions.
professor yeah thank you for uh, taking us through the journey you have taken the last several decades uh, astounding performance and uh, we yeah thank you sir and we we know you uh, through several articles several publications in the years in the last several years we have been you are a quite a popular name among us but i we thought uh, having a talk like this will make you uh, your insights your views which can remain are going to be an inspiration to several of the younger colleagues who are attending this program that was one other thing thank you for no, this no, wonderful absolutely and see i i tell people that you have to be in order to be successful you have to have three four things so one of course you have to do hard work of course you have to have talent but talent alone is not enough so you have to have extremely uh, hard working uh, so you never say no to anything you are always available you and you want to do innovative things because you cannot just uh, be a different person if you are not going to do new things so you have to do new things these things are common people can do these things so people can do uh, innovations people can do hard work and people are talented the part that is more difficult is to have a good mentor and a good mentee so you have to have a idea to be able to mentor young people because you cannot go to the next level unless you have people who love you people who uh who feel that you have done everything for them so you have to do everything for them meaning that whatever you like the most give it to them whatever whatever credit you can give at any point in time give it to them and you have to have the best mentors who do the same for you in the sense that you follow the people who are selfless who are secure who do not feel that you are going to compete with them and who feel that you are going to be uh, their colleagues and their mentees so this is a very important concept that i think can be can be very important for everybody to be successful is that you have to have this idea of being a person that men- mentors young kids and at the same time Uh, have great mentors that you can be faithful to and provide them uh, with your support okay uh, straight away the questions have come i'll start the question uh, st sir ninge okay you want to put some points up before going to the question sir no there are two things that i was uh, 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 when i read that i felt uh, is not only uh, a technocrat but is a good human being what is that in lucid time that is that's as he, he mentions spend time with my family next one is physics third one is mathematics i have not heard anybody saying you know, in my lucid time i'll spend my time with the family that sort is a human number 2 he, he mentioned that whatever the excellence you have whatever the technical expertise you have you have to understand your patient and he said i always feel to understand my my patient to understand the difficulties that they have but at the same time i look at the family around him this is a fantastic way of uh, for any physician or any surgeon to learn from him because at times when we have our fast life we forget to even to talk to the families i think that the talk to the families which uh, they have so much a burden in the uh, brain that uh, what is going to happen to him is the procedure is going to be successful is there going to be a morbidity and then that's so we call it as a transparent way of expressing that we may get it but we are having a armamentarium to get over that that is that is, and i i i the, the first time i saw that uh, um, uh, uh, faculty we spinaromic you know 
is, is a clinician, is an interventionist, is an innovator, and above all, he said the mentoring people. And that is a very good quality. And I think that uh, that that we everybody who have that uh, listen should think that people who are assisting you as an assistant or anybody, and you should give the credit to them also. I think these are the things I think why in 17 years is a chairman. It is not by pull and push, but is a overall a good decision. As Hippocrates say, that that's made him to come to the, uh, the what you call pinnacle of glory of being, of being a, the, the best center in the world, Cleveland Village. That's all I can say, but I don't want to, because there are a number of other people there, they would like to ask questions, you know, the youngsters are around. Yeah. Thank, and thank you. you again for these kind remarks. And I, I acknowledge that, that the most important thing, being a doctor, is to be available for the patients and available for the families. Because remember that if your family member is sick, how difficult it is. It is so important that you know people want to talk to the doctor for five minutes and they they prepare that how what questions we are going to ask, how we are going to talk, we don't want to upset them. Keep that in mind that how difficult it is uh, for a patient and their family to communicate with the doctors. So if you are available, if you talk to them, if you are if you understand, this solves half of that misery. You know, it's much, much more important than putting a stent in the LED. But it is important to understand that what exactly is their expectation. And a lot of people can do that to put a stent, but it is hard to find the time, find the courage, and find the, find the uh, real interest in this patient and their families. Because this is, this is difficult. It is not easy because we are so busy that it is hard to keep that as a priority, but it is a priority. Dr. Murli, I can add another one saying that, you know, that the word uh, uh, bench to clinical side, from clinical side to bench, is, is adhering to that with the letter and spirit. You see the innovation, the cath lab is not only in diagnostic, his cath lab is always in, in therapeutic, but also innovation there. That is excellent. I, I would say that this combination is a very, very thing. What, Bhupati, what do you say about it? Yes, sir. I'm just listening to the legendary talks and legendary. No, comments. never use the word legendary and all that. You. Sir, you. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, my experience with Dr. Kapadia, sir, was uh, I am a small guy from a small town, uh, Ramavaburam, went to Chennai. I did my uh, cardiology from Delhi. And then I sent, I was, I always used to, I mean, I want to uh, go to, the, I want to, wanted to go to US to do residency because of few family situation, I was not able to proceed further. So I thought, uh, at least let, let me finish my quest of uh, doing fellowship in interventional cardiology and come back to India yeah. later. So I sent thousands of miles, not thousands, maybe 500 miles. I get few replies. <laughs> so one immediate email I got was from Dr. Kamir Kapadia. So a person who is nowhere, nowhere near, nowhere, he doesn't even, he has not even seen. He has replied to email. He's such a humble person. And second time I met sir in 2014 ACC in Washington, along with my fellow colleague after finishing interventions, uh, Dr. Surbhi Madhwal. Sir might be our affair. Uh, we met uh, uh, with uh, sir in 2014. He was so humble, down to earth person. I have never, I mean, it was so, uh, I, I mean, I, it was a very pleasant experience to such, talk to such a legendary figure who, uh, I mean, he, even during that meeting, he taught us uh, how, how exactly to proceed in life after finishing interventional cardiology. Uh, thanks to your advice, sir. I'm still in contact with sir. And uh, he was, I mean, I extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to uh, to talk on his journey from NHL Ahmedabad to Chairman Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, there are a lot of uh, questions what the audiences are interested in asking. Mohdi, sir, would you like to uh, ask this question, sir? Yeah. Uh, one is from Dr. Harish. The He wants to know in detail about the advantage of Unilateral groin injury in uh, Tavern. The one of your paper, you would like to know right, the details. Right, right. So the the so first of all, for last three years, so we did uh, typically we are doing about seven hundred towers a year, 
and uh, it's a large number. And for last three years, we are not doing bilateral access. So just unilateral access. So what is the advantage? So what you do is you put, first you put a, a sheath in the femoral artery a little bit higher. So just below the inferior epigastric, but a little bit higher and put one per close, not two, just one per close. And then stick the artery, the same artery, uh, about, I would say about uh, two finger breaths below. So about one inch below the first one and then put a five French sheath. From this five French sheath, you will put a pigtail catheter. Normally I don't use pigtail catheter. I use a straight flush catheter in the non-coronary sinus. From the top one, I put the tower sheet and then do the tower. The advantage of going in the one groin is that when we are done, we remove the tower sheath, take a picture from the lower sheath right there because the lower, now we close the groin with the one per close. If it bleeds, I put one more angiosil. So instead of putting two per closes and cinching the artery, there's one per close, one angiosil. 60% uh, of times you need an angiosil, 30, 40% you don't. And we published all that. So then you take out the top sheath and take a picture from below with the sheath. So you don't have a crossover sheath, nothing. And if you need to do a balloon of the site, if it is pinched and if you want to fix it, you just put a balloon in the lower sheath, pull back the sheath and inflate the balloon. So it makes it very simple for the patient. You don't have to go into groins. You don't have to cross over, go from one side to the other, all of those. So this is, a, this is the major advantage of doing this procedure uh, from one groin. If the length of this common femoral artery is short, is it okay to go and stick it in SFA? Correct, correct. So I put it, I don't even take a picture. I put it anywhere because the lower sheath, after we give protamine, I just pull it and put pressure. So hold pressure in the lower sheet. So lower sheet can be in the SFA uh, or can be in the common femoral. It does not have to be in the common femoral artery. Correct. What is the minimum diameter? I read the paper, it's seven millimeter, am I right, sir? You no, no, no. I, these days we do it for any diameter. Okay. So anytime we want to put a sheet. So normally nowadays we are able to do the tower 5.5 millimeter arteries. So up to 5.5, I put it in the same groin. Sometimes it is tight to move the inferior. So the straight flush catheter is tight to move because of the other sheet. Then I put a Lunderquist wire or stiff wire in the uh, straight flush. It's very important to put the straight flush before you put the big sheet. So if you put the straight, you cannot put the straight flush after you have the big sheet. So put the straight flush or the pigtail catheter first, then put the big sheath. And if you want to move the uh, move the straight flush, and if it doesn't move, then just put a stiff wire in that, and then it moves. So it is a fairly fairly reproducible uh, technique that we have used, and in my opinion, it it has uh, helped us tremendously because we can discharge the patient the same day. We don't have to worry about the other groin and all that. And patients also feel good that they didn't have procedure in both groins. So, uh, really, tower under tower again. One quick question comes to my mind. How many savers happening in your center, sir? Are there any savers yeah, happening in your center? We are very large centers, so we still do about same number of sour also. So it is about 400 to say 400 or so isolated sour and multiple valves are close to 1000. So it is a very large uh, cardiovascular surgery program also. So what we do is when the patients are referred for uh, aortic stenosis, we look at the patient not just for their surgical risk, surgical risk, very important, but also look at their anatomy. So look at the sinus anatomy, uh, size of the sinus, size of the, where the coronaries come up and try to understand if we put an aortic valve now, percutaneously or surgically, what will be the future options? So if we put the first valve now such that we cannot put a valve in valve uh, in the future, and if the patient is 70 years old, 10 years later, they will need a valve. And so the question is lifetime management 
of aortic stenosis is very important. So many times we send this patient to surgery to have a surgical valve first so that we can put a valve in valve in the future. Many times we select if they're super high risk, then we do the tower valve. So it is a, uh, it is a fine balance between how we decide one versus the other. And we work, again, very important that the teams are super important. So we work together uh, with the surgeons extremely well. They are my closest friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, whatever is best for the patient uh, works for us because we are super busy. So nobody is looking to do a case or pay, do a patient. Only whatever is best is the right approach. What is your take on a, a low risk uh, bicuspid valve with severe AS? Uh, how, how do you manage them? Currently, we are still sending them to surgery uh, because we don't have enough data for the low risk bicuspid patients. Uh, and if they have aortopathy, if they have, uh, yeah, again, it depends. Now, some people, some uh, patients are very, uh, uh, just very much against having surgery. So those are the patients that we have to talk to them and we have to present the information. Uh, if the rafe, if there's a Sievert one kind of a valve, and if the rafe is very calcified, it's not a good idea to put a TAVR valve in the current with the current technologies. So if the low risk patient with bicuspid valve, we typically send them to surgery. One question from Dr. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go, go. No, sorry. The intermediate risk, would, would you offer a, a sorry, TAVR, TAVR equivalent to SAVR to them? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Intermediate risk patients these days, uh, many of them want to do uh, TAVR rather than SAVR. Uh, so, and that is, that is our uh, typical strategy for the intermediate risk patients. And how will you select your... Uh, tablets in, in, in the tricuspid anatomy and the bicuspid anatomy, uh, other than LUT calcium, uh, any, any specific things you, you have got any preference for any valves or based on only on anatomy? No, there's a good question. So, the valve again, very important to understand that putting a valve in the aortic valve position is both valves work very well balloon expandable, self expandable. The question is that what would be the next strategy? So in the sense that what kind of valve will be possible as a valve in valve in the future? What will give the best hemodynamic options? And what will allow us to have coronary access in the patients where they need coronary access? So those are the questions that we try to answer upfront. So if you have a small annulus, coronaries are high, when coronaries are normal, then self-expanding valve is better. If your annulus is larger, sinuses are big, and you are younger, then balloon expandable valve is better so that we can, in the future, put another valve in valve. Because many times, if you put a self-expanding valve, it will become a tube and will not allow you to put a valve in valve in the future because it will occlude the coronaries because it's supraannular. So those are the things that uh, we plan upfront and discuss with the patient also that these are the reasons why we are doing one versus the other, how we decide the valve and how we utilize it. So, uh, yeah, but it is more anatomical decision rather than anything else. There is a question that says that, what is the mechanical valve? Is it extinct? It is not totally extinct. So if you're less than 50 years of age, uh, then clearly you need a mechanical valve. Uh, if you are between 50 and 60, it's a little bit of a gray zone. About 60, most commonly, we are not using a mechanical valve. Uh, but uh, below 50, that is still... And mechanical valve, as you know, the Onyx valve is now having a trial where without anticoagulation, they want to try just with antiplatelet therapy. So if that really happens with the Onyx, uh, then it would be a game changer in the sense that, you know, you don't need to replace the valve again and, you know, it functions well and all that. So for the aortic prosthesis, uh, this is a very important, uh, very important part that is uh, ongoing right now. 
is on the question is how many chavi a patient can undergo in his lifetime i think we have experience of several patients having a tower in tower so we call it tower in tower so that is that is not a problem i don't see a reason why you cannot have more than two personally uh, the only catch only limitation is that what is the height of the prosthesis because every time you put a new valve the leaflets become a, a tube you know the the older leaflets come to the size of the valve so s3 valve in particular is a little bit taller than xt so currently all our experience has been to put a s3 in xt or and if you do that it's easier because the xt is shorter the s3 is longer but now if you have a longer valve then you want to put another valve or if you put a, a core valve in a, a xt core valve supraannular so now you want to put another valve then it's tricky because you will occlude the coronaries so those are the challenges of course a lot of people are coming out with different kinds of uh, techniques to help with that kind of situation you know we do still do basilica and other things and you know there are there are newer technologies coming out to deal with this particular problem so yes you in the future you will have uh yeah yeah <clears throat> when somebody is asking if the tower is repeated uh, the evo will become less and less no not necessarily again it depends on the anatomy so sometimes the sinuses are large the stj is high so you don't really need to worry about uh, what kind of valve uh, you put um one question i have yeah bubi go ahead go ahead sir sir please you proceed sir oh, see uh, having done so many thousands of tower my question to you is what do you think the need of our innovations we have been using balloon expandable self expanding various other are coming what are the niche area where you feel still the technology is not perfect there is room for expansion and uh, further innovation so there are three areas that people are working on right now uh so one is the uh alignment in the with the commissures so this is very important because if you align them in the commissures properly you will have better coronary access but also better durability of the valve the second is the different kinds of leaflets so remember that all of these leaflets have a lifetime to it and that can be 8 years 10 years in that ballpark so there are new technologies happening to say that you will have a better longevity of the valve uh, by different leaflet technologies and the third area is the hemodynamics part so there is a there is some some question uh, that some valves function better than others especially with the smaller uh, annulus and you have less patient prosthesis mismatch so those are the things that we want to uh, improve upon as we go forward and the fourth and the most important one is to say that ability to do valve in valve so you want to have a valve such that you will be able to do valve in valve in future so those are the areas that several people are working and what is the longest time we have compared the surgical implanted so the versus tower so tower and sour comparison is now up to about 5 years uh in a randomized core lab adjudicated studies uh i wrote a paper for all the surgical valves to say that how 11 different definitions is in jama cardiology to say there are 11 different definitions of surgical valve deterioration so to compare from a single center from this thing is not worth it because people come up with all different numbers num different things because remember that a lot of people used to say that the valve lasts uh if you you know the definition of structural valve deterioration so the work 3 criteria are going to be published soon and uh, that will address this question and somebody is asking that is there sufficient data to say the long term durability no there is no not sufficient data but at the same time 
whatever we we see right now uh, at least it is not it is not uh, looking uh, it is looking optimistic it is not looking sad so that is the way to put it and the question about biodegradable struts are uh, well Uh, yeah, bio, yeah. See, it, it is not the struts. Remember that you cannot degrade the struts because it has to have a structure to it, right? So this is a you. We need to have the valve not collapse because the valve is different than a stent. So we cannot really have a degradable. So that doesn't exist, right? Do you think we can? We we can. create a therapy like pcsk9 or canaclimumab that decreases ldl or decreases inflammation so that we can make the valve normal by giving some therapies where are we uh, are you looking at it in near future you are absolutely right there are lot of different uh, lot of different uh, first of all therapies there are some mechanical therapies for the moderate as to decalcify the valve vitamin k2 has been tried by some people and i think that is a in my opinion a, a simple thing to do so many people who come to me with moderate as i tell them that take vitamin k2 supplement uh which is harmless um and there might be some benefit to that uh so there is uh because vascular calcification uh is a very important and interesting area uh that a uh, lot of people are working on right now but you are absolutely right that the medical treatment to keep the valve last longer is very important have you come across any uh, particular right like bundle branch reentry and bt after tavern not really no okay because it was one other thing like uh, one of my mentor dr narsimhan before the first time post surgical uh-huh. aortic replacement because of the impingement on the is bundle system there can be a scope for a bundle re entry the short case so similar thing should have happened because when we are putting a uh, thing like possible, uh, like yeah. i have not seen one but it i'm sure it's possible somebody must have seen it okay thank you very much for the wonderful uh, wonderful time with you guys and uh, great questions and uh, meeting you all together uh, yeah. so okay we will stay in touch and uh, thank you yeah thank you thank you thank you, you. sir being a uh, thank you very thank much you. sir i think uh, he made our day now um, <laughs> a wonderful evening for us is a is a treat to listen to him thank I you i will under thanks to him yeah thank you thank you thank, thank you, you sir. sir thank you thank you everyone thank you murli and bupati thank you wonderful program wonderful program yeah happy weekend to all happy weekend to all thank you uh-huh.